SF State's program in visual impairments presents Tech Talk Number 10 3D Printing for Non-Visual Geometry Instruction Presented by Joan Horvath and Rich Cameron Non-Scriptum LLC All right, hey everybody, and welcome to our Tech Talk Number 10 Tonight, we are going to hear from Non Scriptum and Joan Horvath and Rich Cameron. And tonight's topic is 3D printing for non visual geometry. Um, I'm really pleased to hear this content tonight. This is something that we've been working on in collaboration with the Smith Cattlewell Eye Research Institute, who very generously supported this project. Um, so, this is one part of our three P's for 3D printing project. Three P's um, meaning printing, practice, and pedagogy related to 3D printing. Um, and with that, I will hand things off to Joan and Rich, and you guys are going to take us on an adventure for the rest of the evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, um, so uh, Rich and I are a, a little two-person company, and uh, we'll get into what we did and, and everything else with some, uh, some slides. Um, if anybody needs us to describe things more, um, I'm not as expert at this as Ting is, so um, if anybody needs active description here, you know, feel free to throw a question in the chat. And uh, Rich, maybe you can keep an eye on the chat um, while I'm talking to make sure I don't miss anything um, about that. So with that, let me start sharing my screen here. All right. So what we're going to talk about is 3D printed geometry. And as Ting said, this project was supported um, uh, through Smith Kettlewell, and it was um, supported by a grant um, from the Agency for Community Living. And of course, we're grateful to Ting and to Chansey Fleet, who some of you may know, and of course to Smith Kettlewell for bringing us in on this. So what we're gonna talk about is um, a little bit about who we are, just so you know where we came from. Um, 3D printing in 30 seconds, because um, that's all we have time for, because um, these are 3D printed models. Uh, we'll talk about why we designed them the way we did. Um, they're designed in a program called OpenSCAD, so we will demo, dem demonstrate that. Uh, then we'll talk about lesson plans we did um, under this grant, uh, 15 lesson plans. And there's also a book that just came out from Make, uh, the people who do Make Affairs, uh, that covers some overlapping territory there, and, and we'll talk about those. And we will do the world's fastest fly through a whole bunch of the models so you can get an idea of what some of them look like. And Rich um, will do that with his usual grace, speed, and precision. And then we'll give you some links and try to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So that is the plan. We'll see how we execute on that plan. So who are we? Well, Rich and I formed this little company called Nonscriptum. That's Latin for unwritten. So it's an ironic name because we write things. And we founded that company in 2015. Um, we've written eight books since 2015. Um, the most, the latest is is Make Geometry, as in the Maker Fair folks, as I said. And um, we will have links for that and stuff um, in a screen at the end that will hold on longer. And that just came out a couple weeks ago from Make Community LLC, which is the re reborn um, Maker Fair folk. Uh, we have LinkedIn Learning Courses, which used to be lynda.com. Um, we do kids' classes through Institute for Educational Advancement. Um, all this stuff is on our website, which is nonscriptum.com. Um, we do consulting, professional development, all that stuff. Um, Where did we come from? I'm a recovering rocket scientist, so I'm trained as an engineer. Um, worked at JPL for a while. I'm bad at bureaucracy, so I moved on and did various entrepreneurial things. Rich designed some of the earliest uh, consumer 3D printers. The two of us were together at a company called Deesmaker 3D Printers here in Pasadena. Um, unfortunately, that company did not survive having the printer cloned by a very low cost Chinese provider. So that was the end of that. So we moved from that to doing training. And our company focus is that we um, teach people how to use 3D printers per se, but we also have a specialty area now that we're kind of somewhat alone in um, coming up with ways to teach STEM using 3D printing and open source electronics. And so I have two models up here from our earlier book, 3D Printed Science Projects, and it is a um, 
set of airplane wings that are accurate World War II wings that you can print out and stick in front of a fan and see how much lip they generate. So that's a fun model. And we have a model of how, how plants grow. And so I'm showing here uh, a, a plastic camellia that um, we planted, we printed over the, the weekend. So that's the sort of thing we do. All right, 3D printing in 30 seconds. If you haven't seen a 3D printer, this is what they look like. This happens to be one that Rich designed. This is the one that uh, that was cloned by China, and it became the Creality printer, but not by us. Um, the uh, printers work by taking um, a uh, something that looks like, but isn't weed whacker wire. Um, it's a thin filament on a spool. It melts it um, in a nozzle. And then on a flat platform, a layer at a time, you build up an object. And that's how that works. So um, when a printer like this meets school children or teachers, with all respect to people in the room, um, the printer usually gets the worst of that and gets beat up and, and, has, a, and has a tough, short, and, and brutal life. And so we design our, all, everything we do so that it will print on a printer like that, um, in case you wonder when you see ours. So everything is designed so that it will survive a, a troubled school 3D printer with luck. Um, and, uh, and that's basically all there is to it. If you have a printer that is um, prints with liquid resin or something else, these, these um, models were not designed for that. That is a more sophisticated printer and we assume that most people would have this sort of printer. If you haven't encountered a printer like this before, um, they cost a decent one now costs about 350 bucks. Um, some of them at that price range catch fire. Um, when the recording is off, we'd be happy to recommend buyers. We try not to recommend in public to so keep our neutrality. Okay, so that's 3D printing. So what we did was we came up with um, geometry models that are 3D printable. And we came up with models that are um, covering a large fraction of the middle school and some of the high school geometry territory. We didn't cover every topic because not every topic um, rationally is covered with a 3D printer model, right? I mean, some things that just doesn't make sense. Um, so we picked the things that really would benefit from being 3D printed both for visually impaired students and also for the general student because people um, do often learn better by being able to handle something. Um, the models are um, not just something you download and and can't do anything else with. Um, they are built so that they can be altered based on the math. So a student can go in and change um, some numbers, and I'll demo that quickly in a couple minutes. Um, and so you could actually you know, take one of these models, have them change some things, have them print out something, and you have a 3D printable assessment if you like. Um, so we made them, again, so that things are reasonably easy to print. Um, we tried to avoid some of the things um, that make things not easy to print um, or make them tedious to, uh, to post-process because we know a lot of TVI spend a lot of time getting a model and then having to fuss around with it. We tried to minimize that. And we used only free software. So that link there, openscad.org, that is a, um, the program that we use. The program is also accessible. Um, it is the only, to our knowledge, text-based computer aid design program. So you can um, use it with a screen reader, I am told. Um, Chancy Fleet is working on directions for being able to do that. I don't know if um, Chancy has come in, but um, at any rate, um, she is working on that and has been teaching classes out of the New York Public Library on how to use those while visually impaired. So hopefully this is an end-to-end -end accessible universe. And where it isn't, well, we'll try to patch it. Okay. So, um, whoops. So I'm now going to draw change out here and do a little demo. If you are in the mood, um, OpenSCAD uh, can download very, very quickly. You could go to OpenSCAD.org and click on download and download the software appropriate to your Mac, Linux, um, or uh, Windows machine. Um, it does not work on Chromebooks at the moment. Um, so it doesn't run in a browser. It actually downloads onto your system. So if you have a Chromebook, you're unfortunately out of luck. 
um, but we keep waiting for them to do that. So let me stop sharing for a minute and bring up my OpenSCAD demo. Meanwhile, any quick questions here? OK, Ting is helpfully giving links here. All righty. So let me reshare here. Where'd it go? There it is. OK. And I lost my window. Stand by here for just a second. That's weird. Sorry. There it is. Okay. So this is what OpenSCAD looks like. So what OpenSCAD lets you do is something like this. I just typed cube 10. Poof. I have a cube that is 10 millimeters on side. I just saw some chin drops, chins drop. Yes, indeed. All right. I can do things like cylinder. Um, height equals 10. Um, oops. Radius equals 3. And I can do that. I can get fancy. I can subtract one thing from another. I now have a cylindrical hole through in my cube, and so on. So I can do a whole lot of stuff. There are a whole bunch more things. Um, OpenSCAD has a really, really nice manual. And if you don't want to do that, um, we have in our um, lesson plans a teacher's cheat sheet short guide, and also we have two chapters in our Make Geometry book about that. So that is what OpenSCAD looks like from, from zero. And so there is a command line interface so that you don't have to depend on this. The only thing that you obviously don't have the visual feedback um, if, you, uh, if you can't see the screen. So we have had... Um, at least one visually impaired student remote um, learned to use OpenSCAD, and so he uh, he managed to get that to work end to end. So so it is possible, but early days. Let me share now one of our models, and then we'll get into the actual models, so you can get an idea of what it looks like. All right. So this is a model that Rich is going to demonstrate in a minute. It um, cuts off the angles of a triangle, and we'll show something cool that that does. But for the moment, we're just going to let you show see what a real model looks like. So this is not huge. That's the whole OpenSCAD code for this thing. And what you can do as a, um, as a user or as an assignment for your student is you can change numbers and change what kind of triangle you got there. So that you can mess around with these things. If you wanted to, for some reason, you could make it thinner and so on. So a student can go in and actually change some of these things. And what these, these things that you can change, um, you know, what can, what you can change and what you can't are documented so that you can figure out um how you want to do that so basically it isn't just um i'm going to print out this thing and oh gee i wish i could have these five other cases you can actually go in and change these things um, and do that so let me go back to my slides oops So this obviously brings up the question, what, quest, what, what uh, models have you built? So we have 15 um, lesson plans. There's also a teacher's guide, which um, notes the common core standards that they, um, that they line up with. And so 
I will read them quickly in case anybody can't see them. Um, first one's polygons, Pythagoras, and polyhedrons. So it is um, making various 3D shapes, um, and Rich will demo, I think, one thing from that. Um, triangles, um, they're types and areas, so as a model of how to figure out the area of a triangle. Uh, congruent and similar triangles. There's a brief introduction to sine, cosine, and tangent with kind of a fun little slide rule-ish analog model that we built that people really like and that um, has been very popular with people who piloted some of this stuff. We show the difference between inscribed and circumscribed polygons. We um, slice cubes and prisms and cylinders and spheres. We have volume, volume, and more volume. I should acknowledge here that Laurie Schindler kind of got us into this mess um, like six or seven years ago. And one of the first things we did um, just for sort of our own entertainment um, collectively was, was some volume models. And so Lori, this is the, the um, fifth or sixth generation of which you had the first. Volumes of spheres, cone and cylinders, pyramids and prisms, volume, volume all the time. Um, some things about conic sections, um, surface area and nets. And I think these are really fun models. Some things about ellipses, circles, parabolas, hyperbolas, rotating shapes, and coordinate systems, and all of that in 15 lesson plans. And yes, it is a lot of stuff, but it's all there, and you can look at it more slowly going forward. All right. So what we're going to do now is Rich is going to take over and go through these models. And so the models, if you are um, someone who is wondering about uh, this, they're available. Whoops under Creative Commons license and in a repository. All right, so here is the first model. Now that may look familiar because that is the, um, the model we just saw the OpenSCAD for. And so the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. And that's all fine to say, but let's prove it. So we take off each of those um, pieces there, each of those angles, and we can rearrange them to make a half circle to show it's the same 180 degrees. And so um, one of the things that was an interesting design story with this model is that I was messing around with this with paper and I kind of cut the, um, the corners off a triangle and then I completely lost track of which triangle went with where and with who. And so the nice insight Rich had here was, well, hey, this way we can also show that 180 degrees is also half a circle. So I think it's a really, really nice um, tactile, uh, Ting calls it the, um, the math magic show. All right, go ahead, next one. So um, tetrahedron and cube is next. All right, you can do that one instead. Okay. Not according to the list you gave me. So, um, all right, so red try, all right, go ahead and use that one. All right, so if I have a circle, the biggest triangle that'll fit inside it is an inscribed, it's called an inscribed triangle. If I have a triangle with the same size circle in it, if I have a triangle with this, the other, the triangle with the same size circle, there we go. Um, you'll notice there's sort of a lot of plastic there. And we can overlay those two to show that um, one, um, the circles are the same size as each other. We must have a little bit of lag here. There we go. So first of all, from a tactile point of view, you can show that these two, um, those two circles are the same size as each other. The other thing that's interesting is if I have um, now a shape that has more sides, a 12-sided shape, And I do the same thing. Go ahead and overlay those. You'll see how much less plastic there is than the previous one. Maybe maybe you can lay them, you know, maybe you can lay all four things out there. So this is a very, very old, as in about 2,500 year old proof. Um, or a way of approximating the number pi. And so if you, um, the Greeks knew how to compute the circumference or the, um, the perimeter, I guess I should say, of any polygon. 
And so they knew how to figure out how big those two triangles were. And they knew that the um, circle had to be somewhere in between. And they knew uh, if you had a 12-sided thing, how big that outer and inner polygon could be, should be. And so they could actually, over time, approximate pi. And so this is a very, very um, old proof for figuring out how big pi is. And it's a very intuitive one, too. And so we show the the angle um, of each of those interior polygons is um, is recessed there, so you can feel it and um, and tell that it's where it is um, relative to the overall polygon. All right, so um, let's bring up the tetrahedron and cube. So this is a very old puzzle attributed to Pythagoras, and. Um, that tetrahedron fits in that cube, but it doesn't, it looks like it shouldn't because the side of the tetrahedron is a lot longer than the side of the cube. And we do a lot of events. And so, you know, show, be ineffectual here, Rich, and show how people usually try to stuff it in there. So people fuss and they fume and they mutter and they whine and they whimper and they, you know, give you dirty looks and stuff. And then to really annoy them, um, what you have to do is line up the diagonal with the diagonal of the cube and and pop it falls in there tremendously visceral tremendously satisfying really good way to um, let a student understand um, the difference between a diagonal and the side of something and um, you know pythagoras knew his stuff obviously and um, it's kind of fun to to play with we had one kid who figured this out after a very long time at an event ran and got his sister you know, stood there looking superior while, you know, she fussed with it. And then he just reached over and put it in. But that was cheating. We didn't rat him out. I was tempted. But, you know, okay. So um, we now have what we call our trigonometry slide rule. So what we have here is um, a right triangle. And the hypotenuse of that right triangle, we just say it's one in some units. And sine of an angle, just sort of put it at some angle and leave it there. So point at one of the angles. Just pick an angle and point at it. Okay, so the sine of that angle is just that opposite side over that hypotenuse, right? So we just have marks there that are indented. They're pretty easy to tick along with a fingernail. Um, so you can just read off the uh, sine of that angle from that side, and you can read off the cosine from the other side. So you can move it to show, you know, as the angle goes toward zero degrees or toward 90 degrees, you know, you can hold that there and, um, and feel how that changes. So it's a really good way of sort of dynamically playing around with, you know, how do, how do sine and cosine change as the angles of my triangle change? So it's an, an analog calculator, if you like. And uh, math teachers who have played with this have really, really enjoyed, um, you know, showing those extremes to their students and having them kind of try to estimate 45 degrees and, you know, what's the sine or what's the cosine of 45 degrees and, oh, look, they're the same as each other and stuff like that. So it's a really good way of, it's not a, it's not a precision instrument because, you know, what, you know, you can look stuff up, right? That's what calculator buttons are for. But um, it's really good for building intuition. All right, so next up is our volume models, version four or five or six or seven or something. All right. So why don't you, yeah, why don't you take them apart? All right, so we have here, and the perspective is such it's a little bit hard to see that one of them is a cone. You might want to turn the cone sideways a little bit because it's hard to see the cone. So. What we have here is a cone, a half, um, half sphere, and a um, cylinder. And they all have the same radius as each other, which you could prove if you felt like it by putting one on top of, the, top of another and all that kind of stuff. And so we have the shapes. So you can see the solid shapes. But we also have little molds there that those shapes fit into. And the idea is that you can prove to yourself what shape this is by handling it and all that good stuff. Putting one into the other, they fit in there um, thusly. Um, but you can fill these um, empty ones with sand, or we used uh, Himalayan, pink Himalayan salt for the book because it was a nice color. 
Um, and you can prove to yourself that the ratio of those three volumes is one to two to three, or three to two to one. So the, uh, the cylinder is three and the, um, the, well, all right, the cylinder is three, the half sphere is two, and the cone is one. And so you can, uh, again, play around with getting some intuition with that. Um, you can also, the other thing you can do is to make the, um, one of them twice as big or another one, um, you know, make them, make them enough bigger or smaller if you want to so that they all have the same volume. Um, and uh, we, we have, um, for a long time, we had a set that were all the same volume as each other. Um, and uh, you, if you had them out at an event or not that I'd ever bring them to a bar or anything, but if you did such a thing, um, you'll discover that people have no intuition about volume at all. And they will really argue with you about which one's the biggest and which one's the smallest and it, it doesn't look it. So, so this is a nice way of, um, of being able to play around with both the, the positive versions of the shapes um, and, um, and also the negative version if you want to fill them with something. And because Rich thinks of absolutely everything, there's even a little handle so that you can pry out the, um, that one. And we did that because it would get stuck in there, we discovered. So, so because Rich thinks of absolutely everything when he designs models, the other two don't stick in there like that. Okay, so next up are our nets. Um, so I'm not sure which one you're going to show here. Okay. So um, flip it over for a minute so that they can kind of un understand what it is. So you probably, if you teach geometry, you probably have at some point had a piece of paper that looked like this. And uh, what it is is a bunch of triangles. And the idea is that you cut it out of paper. And if you're an extremely patient and careful human being, um, you are going to be able to take that piece of paper and fold it up and make, in this case, a... Um, I'm not sure which one this is. All right, an octagon. Octahedron. Octahedron, all right. So what we've done instead, flip it over, um, if you would, is we've actually filled the volume so you can get some insight into the volume and then magically, go ahead and fold it up, poof. You can just fold these things up and get your shapes. Ta-da. So that's an octahedron. I think I also left you the 20 sided one, right? Or, yeah. Oh. So, this is, uh, yes. So, as quickly as you, you know, are visually impaired, this is a lot better way to be able to um, fold these things up. These are a little fiddly to print. Uh, we are, Rich is probably going to post pretty soon an updated version of this that's a little less prone to breaking. But even so, um, they are, uh, they're really nice to, uh, to be able to, to get some idea of how all this stuff works. All right, so we have the volume of revolution up next. This is um, this is more of a high school subject, but it really lends itself to 3D printing. So what we have here is a square, or two squares. Well, I can't quite see it from that angle, so maybe hold them both up. There you go. Now, if I take um, the square that is in Rich's left hand, and I rotate it about um, like he's doing here, I will get a cylinder. If I run it through an axis that runs through the middle of one side, I get a cylinder. If, however, I take that very self-same square and I ro rotate it through an axis that runs through two of its corners, I'll get a double cone. This is a tough um, thing for people Anybody to visualize, anybody who's, uh, who's taken uh, math beyond um, high school geometry has probably hit this at some point and it's really hard to think about. And so um, the, uh, it allows you to, uh, to take any basic 2D shape that um, kind of is, fits some criteria and print them out and then print out what it, what it makes after you do that. So it's a really nice, really powerful uh, model or a set of models, I should say. So it's, again, it's not one thing. You can figure out what you want to use for your surface and then, um, and then print out the, the frame and then print out the pieces. And then there's just a piece of, um, what did you just run through those? Are they copper wire? Yeah, it's just some solid copper wire. Yeah, we've used paper, we've played around with paper clips. Except paper clip will work if you straighten it really well. 
yeah, or um, 3D printer filament sort of works too. So we, we've tried all those things. But wait, there's more. All right, so next up are coordinate systems. And Rich is going to talk through that one because I always get myself fouled up when I start to talk through them. All right. So here is a normal Cartesian coordinate system. You have a grid of uh, 10 by 10 grid in this case. Uh, you can specify coordinate, for example, uh, three, uh, four, which is which would be this point here. Uh, you can also take these into 3D. So we added a another piece here. So you have a now you have a three-dimensional Cartesian grid, and I can take that same coordinate uh, three, four. And then I can count up, for example, five from there to specify a point in three-dimensional space. Uh, if we wanted to do cylindrical coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates, I can swap out the base for this polar version. And now I can do, say, a radius of five a an angle of uh, 45 degrees and five up from there. Okay. So two more things. Um, we also have made um, ellipses, parabolas and hyperbolas, we'll show you the ellipse. So if you, um, the standard uh, kid thing to do to draw an ellipse is an ellipse um, is defined several ways, but one way that is defined is um, the, uh, that there is a constant length between its two foci and the sum of the distances from its two foci to any point on the ellipse is a constant. So the way you normally do this is that you have two push pins and a piece of string and you push around. Obviously that won't work if you can't see. So this is um, a, a little slider that um, has a string through it and slides around. So it's kind of a moral equivalent um, to that. Um, and I realized, Rich, I left the, um, the uh, conic sections overall off the, um, oh, I missed, I just skipped it by accident. So we also have conic sections generally So we have the ability to just slice just one, if you want to just slice a cone. And we have a little, to make it easier to tell what goes where, the um, slices have a little lip on one side and a little um, bevel on the other, so that you can tell what part is supposed to fit into what part, to make it a little easier to keep track. Because we discovered when we played with them with our eyes shut, we got lost and confused. So, um, so they have little bevels to give you a a tactile clue about how they go together. And I see people trying to look really closely at the screen. So just hold those still for a minute there, Rich, so people can can see how that works. And that and how big that bevel is is something you can change too. It's a parameter if it's too much or too little. And as a side note, that mo that material is called Blood of My Enemies. It's my favorite. Translucent red if you can't see it. Um, the uh, the multiple conic section model here, I, I managed to skip here. There we go. So if you, you probably have a classroom model that looks like this if you teach geometry. This is a cone that is sliced all the ways that a cone can be sliced. So you can slice off the top of a cone. It has a little bit of museum tack on it so it doesn't fall apart. You can slice off the top of a cone so you get a circle. You can slice it at a bit steeper angle so you get an ellipse. You can slice it at a bit steeper, steeper angle so you get a parabola, and finally you can slice it at a yet steeper or shallower, depending on how you look at angle, so you get a hyperbola. So you can buy these things, but they cost a bazillion dollars, so this is a way to do it for a few bucks of filament. We, we printed two copies, that's how we got two colors, if you're wondering, um, and uh, that way you have two copies. 
All right, I think I got everything from the geometry book. I'm going to, we're going to just show you two um, models that are from the book as opposed to from the curriculum, just because um, our one, our n equals one blind student really loved them. Uh, so first we have um, a, a, a Gothic window. Okay, well, first we have a, so this is kind of an interesting um, thing. We have a chapter in the book about, um, about uh, thinking about how medieval people used um, used geometry because they had very little in the way of tools. And so what this is, there you go, is um, Gothic windows you can make with nothing other than circles. So maybe um, along the top of that, there's a, uh, a circle there that is centered on the far side, and a circle on the other side that is centered on the other far side. And you just keep doing that and you end up with interesting um, church windows that uh, you make with just circles. We have a, a traditional construction with a um, with a compass and also have these in open scat so you can make cool windows. And um, not to, because you have need a, you need a castle first before you can have a window like that. Um, the project that is um, scaffolded throughout the book, uh, that's the end of it, uh, is making a castle with, well, of course, Gothic windows. And so that's that's the um, the project that we uh, that we do throughout the Make Geometry book, um, and it's uh, designed to be a, a good constructivist um, low floor, high ceiling, wide walls project that you can can change and do a lot of different different things with. All right, so um, why don't you stop sharing your screen there? I promise I'm almost the end. I'm trying not to exhaust everybody here. All right, so let's see, let me share my screen for my slides here. All right, so um, just to uh, kind of wind this up here and leave time for questions. So um, you uh, can learn more if you want to on our website, which is www.nonscriptum.com. Uh, the lesson plans that cover the sorts of things we've been showing you are on nonscriptum.com slash geometry. Those are free and open source. Um, if, uh, if you're familiar with open source, they're a type of open source called CC BY, which means that you need to attribute them to us, but otherwise you can freely copy them. Um, there is a contact form on um, nonscriptum.com to get in touch with us. I'm sort of reluctant to put my email address out there because this is being recorded. And um, well, we get we get a lot of spam email. Um, there is a classes page for upcoming classes, and an events page for our meetups. We run two meetups. Um, one is for um, people who are trying to figure out better ways to teach STEM remotely, um, and that is every third Tuesday. And I the next one is next Tuesday, maybe I don't know. You can look at it. And we also have a three D printing meetup, which is roughly once a month, um, and uh, we have people come and give little talks. It's virtual at the moment um, about things of interest um, in the 3D printing universe. And um, I'm hoping that next month we will have um, somebody talking about 3D printing houses. We're, we're trying to work that out because they are in Europe and that makes the time a little challenging. So our Make Geometry book is now out. That's what it looks like. It's available. Um, on uh, makes maker shed and um, in ebook and paper book form form and this is the first time we are publicly going to say because it's first time it's been stable um, that the ebook has um, alt text on the images um, and we're very proud of that and we really thank make for for uh, working with us to uh, to do that um, there is going to be an update to the alt text because um, the uh, the decorative images there are there's graph paper on every like every third page that's just an edging and so unfortunately that's an image everywhere and so that's not labeled right now but um, make says that when they do an update of the ebook they push an an update to everybody so you don't have to wait for that um, but it does have all text um, that is a new thing for them so if there are problems you know drop us a line and and we'll see what we can do to, uh, to make it better. Um, other retailers are paper only. Um, Amazon has it, um, Barnes and Nobles. Um, it's being distributed by, uh, by a big distributor and um, 
O'Reilly, and so uh, so it's available pretty much everywhere. Um, we are doing a much slower version of what we did tonight, um, split into two two-hour classes. Um, if you want to be talked through this in more detail, we are doing um, an introduction to 3D printing for educators on October 21st, which is a um, Thursday um, from 5 to 7 uh, Pacific time to be a little kinder to people on the East Coast. And um, we are doing a, um, a walkthrough of uh, geom the geometry models, um, focus more on the models in the book, but there is heavy overlap and the philosophy is the same. And uh, we are walking through that on uh, two weeks after that on November 4th, which is a Tuesday. And each of those classes is only 25 bucks. So um, we're trying to, to make this as accessible in the dollar sense as possible to people who want to do that. So in those, we'll go through um, uh, slowly through, uh, through lots of things and, um, and talk through them because there's a lot of stuff here. Um, people have asked, uh, I don't know of any of our people who are interested in this, um, you know, where they can get stuff printed. Um, public libraries tend to have um, 3D printers. Um, of course, public libraries love their maker spaces. They're closed right now. Um, there are a couple of groups, nonprofits, trying to um, trying to see if they can um, can get people to 3D print stuff for TVIs for free. Um, C3D is she C3D.org? Do you know, Rich? We might have to look it up real quickly, but it's SEE3D either .org or .com or something. Um, She's trying to. It's a that's a it's a very um, wonderful idealistic undergraduate in Ohio someplace who is trying to get resources and get um, people to use excess capacity to print stuff for TBI. So she's working on that. Um, and uh, we do not do printing um, ourselves. Um, we're a two person company and we we focus on making content. So we are not a service bureau, um, but a lot of service bureaus are um, are getting more reasonable for this sort of stuff too. All right, so I will, and um, we're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot. Rich is on Twitter a little bit. Um, what says his Rich's uh, um, alter ego on uh, on uh, the internet. So I will um, stop sharing my screen and then take questions here. So questions, comments, c3d.org, there you go. Have any of you tried any of the models yet? I know it's been out for a little while and I know a few of you were in Ting's class and stuff like that. No, not yet, not yet. So Ting, do you have anything to, uh, to add? I tried to leave some time here to have a little bit of discussion. Uh, you know, I was just thinking um, at the beginning when you're showing the models, um, and especially in working with OpenSCAD, uh, the thing that struck me was, even though OpenSCAD is fully accessible with a screen reader, you would definitely have to do a fair amount of pre-teaching with a blind student in order for them to be able to visualize how things have to be laid out and how programming in this virtual environment, um, you you probably have to think about starting with a real concrete manipulatives and understand how whatever you type into the OpenSCAD command line is rendering things um, you know, in the program because otherwise if people don't have a good um, kind of mental map of the OpenSCAD program and how it renders visually, you don't really know what you're rendering until you actually print it out. So, and uh, even for the best people who are programming non-visually and using OpenSCAD non-visually, it's still, you, you hold your breath and you hope that when it comes out of the printer, it's as you imagined. Um, but I would think that when you're in the very first um, beginning parts of teaching a student how to use OpenSCAD, they have to already have some really good um, spatial mapping and conceptual understanding of what they're doing in that digital space. What, what we did with this about if, as your lesson planning. What we did with the with the one student that we did is um, we sent him a model and had his mom print it out, and so he had something to start with. And then he was geometrically fantastic, so he could hold in his head. You know, if you change this, this part's going to get smaller, and he could, you know, hold it. 
and then you know understand this parameter went with went with changing this dimension on the model. So once he had one, he did pretty well. But he did have to have that one, um, at least you know at when he was learning the program at least. Yeah, definitely. And there's a question in the chat from Chris Lockley. Does OpenSCAD work with any type of 3D printer? Yeah, so um, so 3D printers um, use two kinds of software. Um, you can make models in any software. Um, OpenSCAD makes models for any kind of 3D printer. You could make models for a metal 3D printer with OpenSCAD. And so there's another piece of software in between called a slicer that's specific to types of printers. And so you have to use a separate, a, there's a second piece of software in there to go to your particular printer. We'll cover that in the um, Intro to 3D Printing for Educators if people are interested in that. I can drop that link in the chat as well. So it's just makershed.com. So Joan, um, how might you advise these um, TBIs or TBI students in collaborating with the geometry teacher and implementing these models in the classroom? Well, um, one way to start is to ask, um, I suppose, is to ask what they're trying to teach, obviously, and to see if we have a model of it. Um, you know, our judgment was that we didn't do things that we thought you could do fairly easily with a piece of paper or with a line drawing because you guys have cheaper and faster ways of, of making a 2D line drawing, right? Um, so if something, you know, could be done fairly easily with the 2D line drawing, we didn't, you know, we didn't provide a model. So I think the real question is, is it, you know, if there's a topic like volume, for instance, um, that they're trying to teach that there's a model, then you might show them the model and say, you know, is this, because there's pictures in the, um, in all the lesson plans. And so you can show them the model and say, you know, do you think this would, is this what you're trying to teach? And they say, yes, you know, you can do that. And also if, if they're um, computer comfortable or you are, you can also alter it. If they say, boy, you know, I'd like to have a set of these where, you know, I'm, ma I'm making a point where I'd really like to have ones that are twice, this one twice as big as that or something like that. Um, and then you can alter that and, and make something custom if you have the time to do that. Thank you, Joan. I'll be quiet for a few seconds to allow other people to ask questions. You can jump in the chat if you prefer not to, if you're in a noisy environment and you don't want us to hear that. But um, I think the, the, main, the main barrier is just getting started, right? I think once, you know, it's a lot of pieces, but I think once you actually get started, there's just, you know, so much you can do that you really can't do easily any other way. Um, I have an engineering degree and I really found that creating these models really helped me um, think about a lot of the math differently. You know, Rich and I think very differently from each other. Um, and so, you know, we'd say, okay, well, here's this very straightforward math concept. And I would get a picture in my head and Rich would say, what? And <laughs> <laughs> and he would get a picture in his head and I would say, what are you talking about? And, and, you know, after a while, you know, we'd fight out a little bit and he'd um, do a prototype because he's the uh, open SCAD wizard here. And, um, and then we'd play around with it. And then the joke was that he would bang out an open SCAD model in a couple hours and or so and or less. And I would spend two days algebraically proving to myself that it was right. And he'd, I'd say, it's right. And he'd say, yeah, I know. So that's how we roll. <laughs> but um you know it's uh it's it's been interesting and we've really enjoyed um you know working with with Tang and, and Chansey and um and the Smith Kettlewell folks um to to kind of understand you know what are good ways to do this there are no braille labels on this because the feedback we got uh from Lori a thousand years ago um was that 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 just made things complicated and confusing and and it tends to wear off and all that stuff so this no good reason you couldn't, if you wanted to, put braille labels on these things after the fact. If it turned out you wanted to do that for some reason. Um, but you know, the there's a question in the chat from Akila about how much time does it take to create a 3D model? And I'm gonna, I hope you don't mind, Akila. I'm gonna revise your question just a tad bit. 
So, um, because otherwise it's a pretty difficult question to answer, but in terms of the geometry models that you showed us, which all mostly fit into the palm of the hand or are hand holdable, um, about how much time, you know, assuming that everything is perfect, um, should people budget um, to print one of these models? Well, it varies a lot. Um, you know, the castle is probably a four or five hour model, but you know, this um, the uh, the hollow cube um, for uh, for the cube and tetrahedron is probably what twenty minutes or something. So it it really goes as the amount of plastic um, and the models. The the program that that takes the thing that that OpenSCAD spits out and makes a model for a printer will tell you um, how long it's going to take. Um, there's a factor of, you know, two or three just from fast and slow printers too, you know, so there's some printers are a lot faster than others and, um, you know, that is, and knowing what you're doing, you can also make, cut corners a little bit to make them print faster too, but it, it does should, take time. We should also mention uh, that uh, it goes with the amount of plastic, but the, the models are not solid. Uh, so the, the software automatically will hollow them out and put a much smart, sparser structure inside to fill the space. So, so if you have a, so the, uh, if it, Joan you can hold up those models you were holding again. So the, um, uh, the cube, which is, has a very thin wall and is hollow, uh, doesn't take up a whole lot more plastic than the tetrahedron, even though the tetrahedron is a solid shape with a lot more volume. Yeah. So, so and Lori's who's asking. Never printed before. Yes, I was going to ask Lori's question. Yeah. So Lori said, "What might be uh, the what would be a good a beginner print?" Yeah. Um, well, the volume. I think Lori started with the volume there. So the volume ones, perhaps. And um, you know, I think uh, you might try the one of the volume lessons because they're straightforward and it's it's easy to think about, and they're straightforward prints. So you might uh, you might try those, and. Um, you know, they're, they're all designed to be relatively straightforward. It just depends on what, you know, what you're trying to teach. Um, and I don't know if any of the folks from, um, we have some people in India we were talking to who are coming from a, a very low resource universe. And, um, you know, you might be able to get away with making some things in paper and just printing some, of, just printing parts of it that really, really need to be 3D too. And in the, um, the Make Geometry book, um, we do, give alternatives, paper and craft material and stuff alternatives because Make, of course, you know, didn't want us to have to count on having a 3D printer because that's a different audience than, than y'all. So um, in Make Geometry, a lot that we give a paper or craft alternative where we can, um, which you can't always. Uh, one of the things we have in the book is also figuring out where you are on Earth's latitude and longitude, which we didn't do in the, um, the uh, lesson plans just because we kind of ran out of time and topics and stuff. But um, we did do it with, with one blind student who really enjoyed, um, you know, understanding what the angle of the sun was. His mom had to go outside and actually do the measurements because, you know, he couldn't really see that. But he really enjoyed having a, um, having a sundial and being able to think about it. We teach you how to make a sundial. You know, having a sundial and thinking about it and understanding what the angle of the sun was, where he was, and all that kind of stuff. And so I think that um, that was a good experience too. And you might have to adapt it a little bit for your audience, but I think it was, you know, surprisingly easy for him to do. And, um, and he really, and he really had a lot of fun. So, you know, there's ways to take all these things, as you know, far better than I. Let's see anything else. Okay. And with four minutes to go, the chat is quiet. Um, I always, like ending webinars on a community sort of aspect. So I know, Joan, you mentioned partnering with potential local libraries who might have maker spaces and 3D printers. Um, if people just want to connect to somebody who can help with some of the, the, the technical you know, pieces. Um, but I know you guys have done a lot of community building around 3D printing down where you are in Pasadena. So aside from just local libraries, um, what sorts of school groups or other community groups might you recommend TVIs reach out to, to partner with and experiment with 3D printing? Um, we've been talking to a senior volunteer at the Boy Scouts and she's pointed out that um, Boy Scouts have to do an Eagle Scout project and that um, creating a set of, um, of models for a TVI might not be a bad um, Eagle Scout project. And so you might reach out to your local Scout Council 
um, about that. And so um, she was trying to see if she could, you know, create a little bit of a network there. So that's sort of a work in progress um, because they're they're interested in trying to um, to you know increase their disability footprint a bit on um, finding ways to do that. So that's an option or any other service, you know, kind of kid service saying a lot of high schools require some service and they have a maker space and, you know, it might be a little underutilized and so things like that. Um, the 3D printer companies by and large have gotten kind of saturated with this sort of thing um, now that, you know, they're mainstream and the audience is big. So I think probably they're not really candidates anymore because it's, you know, you come up and you say, so there's like 50 models to choose from and, you know, they pale and say that's beyond our, our pro bono. Um, uh, tolerance. So, you know, the good and bad thing about the fact that this is a very big library now is that it's a very big library. And so you can't just say, you know, I want one of everything because it doesn't, you know, people are not going to do that for you for free. But, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's an interesting time because you, you know, now that there is a lot of content, I mean, to go back briefly the where we started with the company, um, you know, we started out saying we we're just going to teach people to use 3D printers in educational settings, and there was no content. Um, so people didn't know what to do with them. So we did our science projects books, and they said, this is great, but we really need kind of a whole curriculum that makes sense. And so, you know, so this is the first time we've done sort of tried to do not end to end because it doesn't make sense to do things end to end. But, you know, the, the pieces of geometry where it makes sense to have a 3D model. So and it's it's been received well, so we're pleased like that. We appreciate the support of this community, particularly, and and Ting for being our cheerleader. Well, there's a lot to cheer about, and I also love. I know we're talking about geometry tonight, but I also love your calculus models too, because I wish I could have actually learned calculus in high school if I had had these models. And I can just see this um, so many opportunities with not just blind students, but also working with their typically sighted peers to have 3D models. And then to be able to graph things using something like the Desmos calculator with sonification and then having tactile graphics. And it's just like this complete multimodal, um, you know, delivery service um, for really kind of universally accessible um, design. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun. Um, it's been interesting. So we'll see. We'll see what we can do next. We're proposing some stuff. So we'll see what happens. That's good. All right. Well, barring any more questions, um, Rich, if there are any links um, to materials that you want to drop in the chat, feel free. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, uh, Joan and Rich and all your work for Nonscriptum. Thank you, um, Smith Kettlewell, I Research Institute, for funding all this work and bringing us all together in this collaborative project. project. Um, and thank you all for coming and sharing an hour of your Monday night with us. So I hope everybody has a good week and um, you can find this recording posted on our VI programs YouTube channel too, okay? Hope to see some of you right. in the, the in-depth uh, in classes. I have a quick question, I'm sorry, this is Michelle. Um, sure. Hi, oh, is it too late? No, it's good. <laughs> okay, my, my, my internet's terrible. So um, yeah, I had a request today to do some 3D um, printing and is it, is it better to just buy one buy a for your program than to just pay for certain things to be made? Yeah, um, you know, a uh, if you buy a um, a reasonably inexpensive printer for about three hundred fifty bucks, the material is about you know fifteen to twenty dollars a kilogram, and a kilogram is a lot. Um, having somebody else print a fist size print for you will probably cost you fifty bucks. So the first, you know six or seven prints will probably pay for itself. I mean, you know, assuming that your time is worth nothing, which I know it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, you know, um, the, the cost has come down now to the point where you, you really don't don't want to ship them out to a service bureau probably just because uh, the cost will be prohibitive. Thank you, Joan, I appreciate it. Yeah, and I think C3D, they're helping people print and ship, right? So we could always yeah. experiment with sending them a print. I know their challenge is paying people to them. print for them, you know, because it's, it's, yeah. I mean, we tried to do a community group too, and, and people got, you know, we, we got a lot of enthusiasm on the TBI side and, and sort of surprisingly very little on the provider side. So, you know, yeah. people want to design stuff. They don't want to print stuff for other people, right? You know, everybody, everybody wants to make a wedding cake and not brownies for the, for the potluck, right? So, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And have a great night and a great week. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much. This was great. I Hosted by Yu Ting Su, PhD. VI Program Coordinator and Assistant Professor. Video Editing by Monica Kilinay. VI Program Manager.